Words are great for describing objective things, you know, like there's something we can agree there's a chair in the room. We can both see the chair, we can say agree what it's called and we can agree it's there. But when it comes to trying to explain anything about our internal state of mind, then we don't have those reference points. I can say, oh, I feel happy or sad, or, but that might mean something totally different to me than it means to you. For me, at least, language is a very blunt tool, but music is totally different. One of the tracks of the album is called Spectrum, and it relates to this idea of unspoken words in the sense that it has happiness and sadness. It has a feeling in it which is very hard to put into words, which are valenced in terms of being positive or negative. They, you know, language seems to set words on this scale, this psychological scale of positive, positivity and negativity. And whereas the experience of being a person for me is never, you know, it's not you're never all happy or all sad. It's you know, some sort of complex mixture. Spectrum was this idea that, you know, sampling this, I guess, this mood spectrum of these valence words, but in a piece of music as a coherent single thing. The visual analogy for that was, you know, this, the, visual, the, the color spectrum and you know, having white light shining into these sort of rock crystal structures by Christian Stangle, which then splits the light into different colors and um, interspersed with, you know, hidden ghosts of human forms. parallel with a spectrum of different uh, patterns of percussion and synth moments and you know it's a very complex uh, piece of music. I guess part of what we tried to do spatially was give each of these little bits of percussion their own pathway in this spherical realm, these repeating patterns and hopefully the idea would be to bring all of these opposing and complex rhythms and spatial moves together into a coherent piece. Music is usually timbre and melody and harmony and rhythm and dynamics. There's all these basics of what music is. Space is not usually something that people imagine as part of music. Dolby Atmos is a 3D mixing and deliverables environment which basically allows you to mix no longer with the limitation of channels but you have to mix thinking about sound objects that exist in this 3D space. The Dolby Atmos file is basically a multi-track WAV where each channel is a, is a sound object um, and along with that channel of audio, you have metadata that says where that sound object is in a 3D space. It could be in a theatre where you have, you know, tens of speakers, ceiling speakers, so you get a full 3D representation of the sound over a sound system. Um, or it could be all the way down to a pair of headphones where it's delivered to you in, in binaural format. There's a, there's a delay between how when it gets into one ear versus the other and how it's filtered through the skull and you can put that information into sound to actually trick your brain into thinking sounds are in particular positions in, you know, with headphone listening. But with Dolby Atmos, you can also have lots of speakers around the room and other, yeah. and other spatial audio. You can have lots of speakers around the room where you can have the sound flying over your head. So you've also got height as well. It's not just direction, there's height as well. When you listen to Dolby Atmos with headphones, then you'll get that binaural sort of spatial environment via those tricks. But when you listen in a Dolby theatre or home, home, home cinema, you don't need the tricks because you've got the speakers around you can actually. So it, it's a sort of equivalent you know, way of providing the experience. Uh, and the way we work is with this 3D model of the space. Essentially, each piece of music becomes you know, a physical three-dimensional entity. And we're, and we're trying to work with, OK, what's the concept for this piece of music? If it was a living, dynamic thing in space, what would that be? Would it be jagged structures or smooth or everything in the middle or whatever? You know, you can you build a sort of you know, a model in the space mm -hmm. with all the sounds, and we're trying to think. We have to figure out what sort of structure would a piece of music be? What can deliver the you know what can deliver the message we're working with? The track called "Unspoken Words." The idea was about what's hidden um, and how when you have a piece of music or a piece of art 
what you can communicate via what you don't see and what you don't hear. And we and you know, part of the the design was then to there's, there's a dancer on screen and to, was to leave an empty hole where the human is, the music isn't. We moved the sound all the way from the image right. to leave this this hole, basically, which for is, as long as we could, and then we, eventually we creeped yeah. it Which in is the opposite bit. of what you would do normally. Although there are no rules as such, there are a lot of opinions that are like, well, look, if you're dealing with traditional bands or orchestras, they've got to sit kind of in front of you and because that's where you perceive them to be and you need them to be spread out like this and you shouldn't move things around a lot and you shouldn't use loads of stuff in the surrounds necessarily, whereas your music is not based in the land of... Yeah, yeah. Um, of real instruments per se, it's all designed and so the rules uh, do what feels right. If we push this to the edge, the extremes, what do we find, you know, what artifacts can we create, what, mm. you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not interested in doing things correctly really, I'm interested in um, making something extreme which at points might be jarring or might be perceived mm. as wrong. If you think of where the initial object within this spherical space would be, we wanted the objects to be centred around the central listening position so that we weren't saying, okay the music's over there, we were saying well it's all around us yeah. and we will deal with it however we see fit and that was really liberating. The whole reason I a lot of the time use these really constant low frequency harmonies as well is because in a live environment, you know, with a big sound system or with a lot of sub in a, in a live room, you get this sort of massage, bass. Body low, wobble. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this low, and that, again, is this really immersive experience. Yeah. And this is why I'm interested in these tools. You know, it's, there's a reason why, you know, I care about Atmos and spatial mixing because it can make a way more direct, you know, communication from this idea of what I'm trying to, you know, what I'm trying to communicate to people can be done way more directly and way more powerfully when I, with these tools. So it's not, you know, it's not just, you know, stuff around the room for the sake of it. From collaborating with Will and the whole team at String and Tins, I mean, it was a lot of fun. Really, really, it was great fun. And with Niels Arends, who was over, you know, an intern that was helping us as well. You know, we had a lot of late nights in the studio, just really enjoying the process. And, He's taken me and my colleagues at work out of our comfort zones and allowed us to experiment on this fantastic project um, in ways that we don't get to do in our day jobs. Usually I'm in control, you know, myself, but I've been the, you know, person sitting watching the engineer in control and essentially asking a lot of questions about what they're doing and taking taking notes about what I should do and you know I've, I've learned countless things so yeah it's been a lot of lessons that I'll take into my productions from now on absolutely. <laughs>